All right. Uh, hi. So my name is Howard Wu, and uh, today I'll be talking about a distributed zero knowledge proof system called the uh, DZIG. Um, this is joint work done with Wenting, uh, Alessandro, Raluca, and Jan. So to begin, let's just uh, define conventions and uh, define a zero knowledge proof. Um, so in a zero knowledge proof, there are two parties, a prover and a verifier, and uh, both know a public function f and a claimed output y. And uh, the prover says, hey, I know x such that f of x is equal to y. And uh, the verifier then challenges the prover by playing this interactive game, uh, after which time uh, the prover will convince the verifier if he or she is honest. Now, one particular type of uh, zero-knowledge proof has recently gained significant attention, and that is uh, ZK-SNARK. Um, a ZK-SNARK is a zero-knowledge proof with a few additional guarantees. Uh, for one, it is non-interactive, meaning the prover only needs uh, to provide a proof to convince the verifier that they know uh, the private input x. But uh, also, it is succinct, uh, meaning that the proof is small in size and the verification time is fast. Now, we're going to focus on one particular type of ZK-SNARK today, and this is a preprocessing ZK-SNARK. And what this means is that there's a setup, and the setup takes as input a public function f, and it will output two things. One is a proving key on the left and the verification key on the right. Note that the proving key here is significantly larger than the verification key. And uh, ZK-SNARKs have a lot of many interesting applications, um, two of which we'll discuss today. So the first application we're going to look at is peer-to-peer -peer payments. Uh, now suppose uh, Alice wants to pay Bob a dollar. Now she may use a blockchain to facilitate this payment. Uh, however, this would reveal that she's the sender, uh, that Bob is the receiver, and that the payment amount is a dollar. Instead, Alice could encrypt these details, um, encrypting the content of the payments, uh, and attaching a ZK-SNARK proof attesting to the, vali uh, the validity of the payment details. And this is actually a protocol called ZeroCash, which has manifested in industry as Zcash. Let's look at a second application. Um, suppose you wanted to use a smart contract to run a publicly verifiable uh, computation. Well, today, the, uh, invoking the smart contract requires validators uh, to rerun the computation. And a more scalable approach is for the caller to run the computation off-chain, sending the result along with a proof attesting to the validity of the result. This way, the validators would only need to check the proof, um, which we've established here is cheap. Now, these are only two applications of zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, don't be offended if uh, your favorite application wasn't included here today. Um, these two applications were chosen specifically to motivate our problem, and uh, we're going to address this now. So there's some good news and some bad news. If we plot the circuit sizes of the applications we just discussed, um, we see that the pa uh, private payment application requires about a million gates. This size is practical for generating a proof uh, with current ZK-SNARK implementations. However, if we look at typical smart contract executions, um, we find that the circuit size is approximately 100 million gates. And for a large smart contract execution, we find ourselves using billions of gates. Unfortunately, current monolithic ZK-SNARK implementations run out of memory at around uh, 10 million gates. And that makes this application just out of reach of current techniques. So we asked ourselves, what could we do uh, and what would be a stepping stone um, for enabling applications like this? Well, so we present DZIC. And DZIC is a zero-knowledge proof system that is, one, distributed, meaning it enables the execution of a ZK-SNARK uh, set up and prover across a compute cluster. Um, and two, it is scalable, meaning it reaches heretofore unreachable circuit sizes, um, up to billions of gates. And the pattern that we see is that if we double the number of machines, um, we can support roughly twice the circuit size. And lastly, it is parallel, meaning it speeds up the time it takes to generate a proof. And the pattern that we see here is that uh, as we double the number of machines, um, it can run roughly twice as fast. So how did we do it? Well, the approach that we took was uh, we started with a monolithic ZK-SNARK, namely the one by uh, Jens Groth from 2016 and distributed it on a cluster of machines. 
Now this approach appears quite simple. Um, however, it turns out that there were a lot of challenges to distributing this. Uh, we chose the GROT16 protocol uh, because it is highly efficient and currently offers the smallest ZK SNARK proof size. Um, and in general, we had to tailor our architecture at every level to ensure that our protocol could adequately demonstrate scalability and parallelism. And so let me walk you through some of the challenges we faced now. So let's take a look at this diagram of a ZK SNARK protocol. Um, I want to point out that the verifier in this context is extremely small and cheap to run. And therefore, we're going to turn our attention to the setup and the prover. Um, at first glance, we'll want to spin up a cluster of machines uh, and run the setup and prover on it. Next, we would want to uh, use a distributed data structure uh, to represent our public function f, our proving key, and our secret input. Now, this looks all right. Um, however, it's not. Uh, there were several challenges that arise with this current setup. First, uh, we're multiplying polynomials of degree that are in the billions. Second, we're representing uh, these polynomials as terabit-sized arrays. Third, we're accessing large pools of shared memory in complex access patterns. And fourth, we're synchronizing shared state that incurs significant network delays. These are fundamental challenges uh, that we need to overcome. And we do so in the following way. So we start with the setup. And it turns out it's not enough to keep the subcomponents of this setup monolithic. And so we distribute the setup by implementing distributed algorithms uh, for each of these subcomponents in the setup. And this distributed setup will now output a distributed proving key and a small verification key. And just as before, we also distribute the prover by distributing the uh, monolithic subcomponents within it. And lastly, the verifier will check that the proof is valid, and again, we forego distributing this step as it is extremely cheap to run. Now, for the sake of time today, I want to focus on one critical part of this system, and namely, this is the distributed prover. Uh, you'll find detailed explanations for all of our distributed uh, techniques within the paper, and uh, today I'm going to discuss uh, on one critical component in the system, namely the witness reduction. I'm going to go over our thought process and, uh, for distributing this reduction um, and show you a few off-the-shelf approaches that we took for computing the reduction, and lastly show you the tailored approach that uh, we used to actually make this thing scalable in parallel. So to efficiently compute the ZK-SNARK proof, we need to reduce the circuit. Um, uh, we started with into polynomial form, and namely the equation that we need to evaluate here is this one. If you haven't seen this equation before, uh, this is an important equation uh, introduced in GGPR 13, and it defines a quadratic arithmetic program. And uh, this has to do with the arithmetization of circuits. So if we zoom in on this equation, notice that uh, there are three terms that need to be efficiently represented and evaluated in order to perform the evaluation. Um, also notice that these terms have summations from zero to n, where n is in the billions. I will focus on how we can make these uh, efficiently evaluate and note that the arithmetic operations outside of these three terms uh, will make use of actually distributed FFTs, which is going to be in the paper. Um, and uh, now zooming in on this term, um, we see that there are two subcomponents. There's a matrix A and a vector Z. The matrix A represents uh, one part of the input wires comprising our circuit, and the vector Z is the satisfying assignment to the circuit. You can think about it like uh, you're combining the public inputs with the private inputs. And uh, the task is to compute the efficient uh, and element, pro uh, sorry, it's to compute the element-wise product of these terms. So we start by representing the matrix A as an n plus one by m matrix. And we'll represent vector Z as an n plus one vector. To evaluate the summation, we need to join the elements by their index i. And as a straw man approach, uh, we may partition our matrix A row-wise and our vector Z element-wise. And then we'll join our operations uh, row-wise, so A0 goes with Z0, A1 goes with Z1 down to AN with ZN. And this creates our join table, which looks something like this. Um, and it actually appears quite uniform in cost, uh, with each entry now independent of all the other entries. However, it turns out that this is not the case, and let's see why. So because of the nature of our circuit representation, 
um, our matrix is what we call uh, almost sparse. And what this means is that most rows and columns are sparse. However, there will always be a handful of dense ones. And if we partitioned our matrix column, uh, column-wise, uh, for the cluster to compute, um, the second column here would be slow, and it would straggle. And this would cause all the other machines to wait on it to finish its task. Now, if we partition our matrix row-wise, um, again, we run into the same problem. Namely, that uh, with the first row as our straggler, calling all the, uh, causing all the other machines to basically wait on it to finish. So we studied uh, a set of the current off-the-shelf approaches uh, to address this problem of data skew and benchmark them across varying circuit sizes and numbers of machines to determine their feasibility. Um, the approach that was taken by these off-the-shelf approaches primarily is to replicate and partition the data so that the computation is distributed evenly. And the first approach that we looked at is called block join. What block join does is replicate each entry in one distributed data set uh, across every machine. And the hope is that when joining with the other distributed data set, uh, the partitions will become uh, even more, what will become more evenly spread across the machines. And what we hope uh, is that we end up with a join table that will look something like this. Now, at first glance, this table looks really large, and it, it is. Um, block join has just performed n plus one times the number of partition replications. And uh, recall that n plus one is in the billions. So every partition here is dense, and therefore the computation is uniform. That's true, however, this table is also huge and impractical to compute. And so this doesn't work for our system, and so we uh, turn to other off-the-shelf approaches. So the next one that we looked at was called skew join. And uh, skew join takes a more fine-grained approach. What it does is it first computes usage statistics and then only replicates frequently used entries for every machine. Now, this sounds reasonable, and indeed, in most cases, it really is. Um, however, again, for our system, it, it does not work, and this is why. So if our matrix A is partitioned row-wise, and we perform a skew join operation with vector Z, um, we'll see that each partition here only needs, uh, access, uh, only needs to access one unique element from vector z. Notice that in this case, skew join is functionally equivalent to uh, 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 the straw man. Now, if our matrix A is partitioned column-wise, um, we need to per perform skew join with vector z, and we see that each partition now needs access to every unique element from vector z. Notice that in this case, uh, skew join is functionally equivalent to the block join approach that we saw earlier. And no matter uh, how we organize our data here, um, off-the-shelf approaches will cause unnecessary replications that blow up our memory. And uh, this makes it impossible to scale our system. Actually, in practice, we find that uh, this foregoing skew joint approach, uh, it can't scale beyond 50 million constraints, uh, even on 128 machines. And uh, until that point, it's still twice as slow um, as our tailored approach, which I'm now going to show you. So we designed and implemented a tailored approach um, to evaluate this witness reduction. And the approach that we took was to isolate and transform the data so that the computation is distributed evenly. Let me show you a high-level picture of how we do this. We'll start with the almost sparse matrix A from before and perform a pre-processing step, whereby we compute the density count for each partition. Now, these statistics uh, inform our system on how to isolate the dense vectors from the sparse vectors, which we do next. So using this density count information, our system will split dense vectors into sparse partitions. Now, to perform the join operation between matrix A and Z, we perform what we call a hybrid join, which replicates only a handful of unique elements from vector Z, as we said our matrix A is almost sparse. And notice in our case here, that each partition has just one dense computation to perform. And our replication factor was minimal, as our approach uh, is able to preserve the almost sparse structural representation of matrix A. So this enables us to join our data and compute the summations from before without stragglers. And in practice, for the same number of machines, uh, we find that this tailored approach now enables us to reach billions of gates, where off-the-shelf approaches only let us go to millions of gates. And so with uh, the other distributed subcomponents uh, we described in this paper, um, we were able to architect a zero-knowledge proof system that is both scalable and parallel. Now, 
we've implemented DISIC, and we've used a cluster compute framework called Apache Spark. Um, our system is written in Java with approximately 10,000 lines of code. And uh, we ran uh, our experiments on Amazon EC2 using uh, R38X large instances. And our evaluations showed us some really interesting patterns and properties. So first, we evaluated our system for the largest supported circuit size. When we profiled LibSnark in our environment, uh, we found that it reached approximately 4 million gates. And when we profiled DISIG across uh, different numbers of executors, um, we found that we were able to reach approximately 2 billion gates uh, with 256 machines. The pattern that we saw was that as we doubled the number of machines, we were able to support twice the circuit size. And this led us to ask, could we compute up to these large circuit sizes in a time efficient manner? And so now we evaluate for scalability. On the left, we have the distributed setup. And on the right, you have the distributed prover. Um, note that this, these graphs are in log-log scale. And notice that here, the slope is approximately 1. So the pattern that we see is that as we double the circuit size, um, it takes roughly twice the time. And we also evaluated this for parallelism. And so here we plot the same data again, but show the number of machines on the x-axis, and uh, we plot the circuit sizes. Um, on the left, again, is the distributed setup, and on the right is the distributed prover. If we take a look at this line, 2 to the 26, um, notice that the pattern that we see here is that as we double the number of machines, um, these operations run twice as fast. And so in conclusion, we found that prior uh, ZK SNARKs support maximum circuit sizes in the uh, millions of gates um, at an amortized cost of one uh, millisecond uh, per gate. Um, and we find that our techniques uh, for DISIC are able to support maximum circuit sizes of billions of gates um, at an amortized cost per gate of 10 microseconds. The, the full paper is available on uh, ePrint. And uh, I'm proud to say that we've released DISIC as an open source library on GitHub. Uh, you can find it by going to DISIC.org. We've, uh, we've had to put a lot of work into making this library available to the public uh, with a convenient profiling infrastructure. And this is so that you can replicate our results, and uh, as well as build new and interesting applications for DISIC. Um, and lastly, I'd like to leave you with two open questions. So the first open question is, um, what techniques will get us to trillions of gates, if any? Um, with this current approach, uh, we would need roughly 100,000 machines uh, in the best case scenario. And frankly, that's too many. Um, the second question is, how efficiently can other succinct zero-knowledge proofs be distributed? Things like Starks and Bulletproofs. Um, it seems like our techniques would be uh, an excellent starting point for this. And so with that, I'd like to conclude, and uh, thank you for your attention. All right, any questions? Uh, there, there, OK. We're going to try and get as many as you can. Hi, I'm curious about your process for splitting the dense vectors into partitions. Uh, what methods did you use and how efficient was that and time consuming? Yeah, so um, the idea is that, uh, are you talking about like the pre-processing phase? Yes. Yeah, so the idea is that we can do like a linear scan across this and we'll know up front uh, which, which, uh, which components are going to be dense. Uh, the idea is that the linear scan allows us to build an index, uh, uh, effectively a bitmap, and that bitmap is what we use um, in the system to basically assign separate jobs for them. Hi, thanks. That was a great talk. Sorry if this is a simplistic question, but is this technique compatible with the um, distributed SRS setup techniques described in the previous talk? Could you easily combine the two? You know, I think that this would be an excellent area to have collaborations. Uh, I, I do think that they could be, and they could definitely fit inside this mold. Um, that's something that would be open for anyone to take on, and if anyone would like to contribute to the library as well um, on this front, so feel free to reach out to me after this. Um, yeah, great talk. Uh, I was wondering, so I have to, do I have to share the witness to all of the nodes? Or so do I have to basically trust all of the nodes with my full witness? Yeah, so in this model, the idea is that uh, I control the cluster of machines. And so I will be sharing pieces of the witness with respect to these machines. And so um, the idea is that I am able to um, uh, assign, and, and I should be trusting this, uh, this set of machines. And it's more about the fact that in this case now, I can actually run proofs at this scale if I had that resource.
Um, I think one of the biggest bottleneck with this uh, type of approaches is uh, we can support large amount of constraints, but what about the public parameters? Uh, if we have gigabytes parameters for um, millions of constraints, we would get terabytes, if not more, of parameters for billions of constraints and, uh, and petabytes for trillions. So what do you think about this and how do we go about solving this? Maybe having log, having systems with log parameters using these techniques could be a solution, yeah. but I don't know any. Yeah, yeah, th no, that's a great point. So two, two things on that. Uh, one is, um, first off, like, Indeed, if you, you would need to have the resources to do this, but from the verification standpoint, this remains cheap. And so it's the party involved for doing the actual proof that needs to have this large SRS. Um, and, the, and the second point is that uh, this system that we present here is specifically for Groth 16, but uh, you know, this is also easily extendable for other types of zero-knowledge proof systems, in which case they may have much smaller uh, SRSs or even uh, no uh, structured reference stream. You know. All right, anyone else want to ask? All right, uh, so we, uh, let's thank all of our speakers again, one more time. Thank you.